yeah, he's trying to take over my life again. Oh. Jeez. Let us not have AI take over our lives. This is Raghu Marcus, and I am back with Mind Rolling with uh, a new guest, Bruce Damer. Bruce, welcome to the show. Thank you, Raghu. Yes, and uh, we have a, a great mutual friend is how I got introduced, Duncan Trussell, my podcast guru, and uh, happy for that. And uh, Bruce is a scientist, and he hails from Canada. We were just talking about that, that we're uh, Canadian brothers. Yes. And yeah. um, so, I, I mean, we'll get into some of the amazing things that you have done. I mean, what did you just tell me? I, I was just uh, setting something up in Japan. Did you just tell me that I just I read that you were? What were you doing? Trying to get the Japanese are going to launch a rocket, right, to pick up moon samples, rock samples. Is that what we're talking about? Yeah, it's actually uh, pretty gosh, gosh darn exciting. I, I flew to Japan two weeks ago to help them design a mission to go to Mars with little what we call origami, a swarm of drones, and release them into the atmosphere. And they'll power their way down to the surface and pick up rocks that we think contain evidence for past life on Mars. Wow. Really? Yeah, and then then they'll create it, they'll they'll collect them in what we call the, the four engineers and I call the rice bowl. Those little rocks are going tinkle, 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 and then the drones connect together with all their props and lift the rice bowl and drop it in the ascent module, and then off it launches. It's a completely radical way of doing it you know when when is it is it scheduled well they're they're look it's initial designs because the americans the americans you know we're in america uh now that we're self-identified as canucks uh we can talk about them them gosh darned americans but uh, yeah. uh let's it, be careful now <laughs> let's be careful now. uh we do not know from which points we hail mm. uh so uh that would be a new mission so the europeans and the americans are planning a great big heavy 12 billion dollar multiple rovers to collect and i was on the mars 2020 rover landing site team mm. and uh we were promoting this site that has these digitate silica nodules all over the place that look like hot spring centers that we would find in yellowstone or in the pilbara in australia where we found the oldest evidence for life on earth three and a half billion years old our colleagues discovered and so which bolsters our origin model that life started in the jacuzzi if you will mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh instead of being baked in volcanoes or somehow somehow emitting from these deep vents in the ocean mm -hmm. which isn't really a tenable idea chemically mm -hmm. so i've been on this track for since I was 14, a little kid in Kamloops, like, how did life begin? And we're we're in a, a revolution now, the cycling system that not only could bring life out of the background of the physics of the cosmos, but it's an explanatory, it's a teacher. You know, it's a great teacher that teaches us how things are spun up, how things are made on a daily basis. Uh, it's like a great dirge that's spinning within spinning within spinning. We may have found the formula for this gosh darn thing that how how it works. Really, I mean that's a huge statement. Wow. Yeah, so it, it's really simple. Um, it, in the wet, dry cycling pools of the Archean or or a Hadean, you had these volcanic hot springs, and they would dry down and refill, and dry down and refill. And falling into them was meteorite material and dust from the early solar system, feeding them with the organics, sort of inoculating these pools. And then as the pool dried down, a bathtub ring would form hmm. of, of uh, fats, like fatty stuff, like you'd see the foam in the ocean, at hmm. the ocean. And the bathtub ring is the synthesis engine to create polymers, stitch them together. And then when the pool refills, the outer layers of these bathtub rings bought off trillions of compartments that each contain random polymers. And we're going to do this again next month in New Zealand in the hot springs there. Uh, we did, I did it last year. And as a result of this continuous drying down to the moist phase and then drying to a dry phase and then coming back and back and back, it's a cycle that can lift 
individual random polymers, they start doing jobs, like they're chips on a roulette wheel, really, or those balls. They land on something that's valuable and they get selected you know, by the great gambler in the sky. Uh, and then some suddenly these protocells, they're called, have functions. They have very primitive functions and more of them appear and they grow into these globular masses called aggregates or progenotes. And it's this unit that we think is the common ancestor of all life, the progenote. Uh, and here's the thing for philosophy and for spiritual thought from that. Mm. Similar to relativity theory that came into the 1920s, we're entering the 2020s with the following new profound insight from science, which is that we do not come from a common ancestor. You know, there's Darwinian selection, of course, is a real thing. But when Herbert Spencer coined the term survival of the fittest, he created, you know, what Ramdas always calls like this myth uh, of separation, that we mm. are separate. Mm. Yeah. So where this ties into Ramdas's teachings is that, in fact, science may be on the verge of showing that the deepest common ancestor of all life was a community in collaboration, not individuals in competition. It's wow. it's. It's breathtaking. And that because, you know, uh, hippies have said we are all one and, you know, ecologists have said it's all interconnected. You can't tweak one part and expect the other part to do well because everything is bound together. But this is actually where we've unwound life to its start point and we'll restart and start that process of moving toward a living world and watch how the algorithms click together. And it's this crowding and interconnected networks grow, and then a memory system rises. It's called PIM, Probability Shaping Interconnection and Memory. Hmm. And I had a dream one night uh, on, on Ram Dass's best friend, uh, <laughs> one particular night about three or four years ago. And the dream, you know, grabbed my shirt collar and said, let me show you how you were made. And it showed, yeah, it showed this PIM thing and this cycling system driven by the sun rising for 4 billion years, like clockwork, pushing energy in. And it showed this silver spire climbing, climbing, climbing from the flat base of microbes into uh, complex beings in that spire, in that sort of icicle. And then it showed the stacking getting faster and faster and this somehow this field emerging, which we might call the ethereal field or Jung called it uh, the synchronous field. Some call it God or unity consciousness or whatnot. But it's made by this PIM cycling, cycling, cycling. Every organism is doing it. Every organism is running through these three phases continuously. And what we're doing right now, Raghu, is we're crowded together in a podcast in Zoom so that we, when we interact, we pass symbolic messages around. That's interconnection. So probability is the, the probability is that we're going to come up with things we never would have otherwise. And then we're making a memory of this and we're going to share it. And that's called cultural evolution. So this PIM thing that we found or on the way to the chemistry may be a universal, mm. what's called a toe, a theory of everything. So I've been presenting it to philosophers and Ken Wilber was very much into it. And mm. Deep Deepak Chopra was, you know, grokking it. Uh, and it's it's kind of an interesting thing. So what does this mean for humanity? It means that from the very taproot of the most f freaking uh, reductionist science, these are non-woo people. You know, chemists are very non-woo. <clears throat> our non-woo brethren. They're, our non-woo brethren. They are going to be looking down the barrel of a microscope in five years, ten years, or whatever, two years, watching this protocellular mass growing through cycle after cycle after cycle after cycle, they're going to stress it with something like put some salt in or high uh, ultraviolet radiation, watch it crash and watch it regrow. And then they're going to sequence it and determine, oh, there's evolution that's happened. Molecular evolution. It looks like a thing that's alive that can respond. And from that, I, I think of that image like being like seeing the earth from space on Apollo 8. Mm -hmm. Like we are seeing the process that made us, that, that lifted the living world from the non-living, and that it is a communal complex in uh, in collaboration in nature. So anyway, that's the the hope for this work. 
right. uh, to come into the our you know the sphere of our consciousness. Mm. So uh, evolution is not survival of the fittest. Correct. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It it is. So in another dream state about five years ago, I was with Dennis McKenna in the Sacred mm. Valley. Yeah, I know that. And again, the ethereal ineffable entity grabs my shirt collar you know the, that's why i wear collared uh yeah, garments sure so that a... so the ethereal or ineffable entities can grab hold and get my attention <laughs> uh, so, oh, so, that's great so in this in this period it said let me show you uh, another view of evolution and it showed protocells or they could have been seen as organisms moving 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 sliced a plane through them and it was like abbott's flatland there's a grid and the organisms come up through the grid like, like bubbles and reproduce on the top of the grid. And then another grid slams down upon them. And that's the selection pressure. And then one pops up, one little fortuitous protocell or stellar living thing pops up and reproduces on the top of the new selection pressure. And then another one slaps down. And these things are moving up and up and up. And the ethereal being saying, what to ask, what do you see? And I said, I don't know, some kind of thing seemed to sort of go through and it, it, it lifts and it sort of gifts what it has learned or its polymers to the next level. And then it goes away. It may be selected out and another one goes up. Are you still there? Yeah, you just froze. Your video just froze. I'm not sure what happened there, but you're uh, breaking. Now you're, you're breaking up. Yeah. So there's something on your side in terms of bandwidth. Is anybody else using the uh, your Wi-Fi? No, you no, no uh, one's here. So it's no. just weather or something. Now you're fine. Oh, uh, fine. Going. So the ineffable said, "What do you see in this grid and these these entities coming up through?" And I said, "It's kind of a lifting. One lifts." the polymers of its evolution that, that managed to make it through that grid and the reproduces. But then the next time this is pressure, another one does it. And it's the backwards way of looking at rev evolution. It's not survival of the fittest at all. It's a lifting and a gifting between states. They lift up, they get through, they give their innovation to the next level of community, which then has to carry it and carry it and carry it. And at that wow. point, the ineffable grabs my shirt collar again and says, you listen and you listen good. Your man Darwin got it right. This is how you were made. But language came in called survival of the fittest. And that is a very uh, destructive language. It's destroying you and it's destroying your world. And change the language so that you can really communicate the beauty of the process that made you without this divisive, divisive uh, language, which of course led to social Darwinism in the 20th century and business Darwinism, which is all wrong. And so can we, and you identify, can we roll this language out of the culture? Mm. And it goes back again to Ram Dass's teaching, which is uh, this myth of separation, you know, because certainly survival of fittest creates a sense that I have to be fitter than you. Yeah. And it's a very Victorian idea. You know, of course, the white people with the top hats wearing brocade coats in the desert are the fitter, right, than a Bedouin, <laughs> right? Does that make any sense to us? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so there's there's the big role for the 20s. Mm. Um, lifting and giving. Lifting and gifting. Sort of lifting making... and gifting. Yeah. It's even more better. I mean... So you know, as, as Ram Dass passed in the last 17, 18, 19 years since his stroke, he efforts were made, you know, on, on the miracle of medicine and a huge amount of care allowed him to gift us probably the, some of the greatest teachings, mm -hmm. you know. So in a sense, the selection barrier came down on Ram Dass of the stroke and it's it sheared off all that extraneous stuff. The, kind of the cage of fame and this and that made him into like i have to have help to take a shit how mm. could i help you became how could i you know all that yep. and and that shaved off that layer to allow ramdas 
in a new form to gift us uh, something really potent coming forward. And we had another 20 years, goodness gracious, of that teaching that was evolved. And it could only have been evolved by the severe selection pressure of the stroke. Mm, amazing. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Now we talk about the the ineffable who just guided you through that particular journey, dream journey, and the ineffable who is, I mean, I don't have any kind of scientific, to say the very least, uh, but I, through psychedelics and through my experience with our guru, Neem Karoli Baba, uh, I started to understand that there there is, it, I don't, have you ever been in, you, you've probably been in Montreal, right? Yeah, got family there, yeah. Oh, you do? Okay, so when I grew up there, there was a way in which in the culture, in the French culture, um, that if they didn't have a word to describe something in a little bit more detail than than maybe was possible, so they would say, oh, you know, that thing there. <laughs> That's right, that thing there. That's now my word for God, okay? Because God doesn't do it, that thing there. It does it. It's, it's, <laughs> it. it's you. At least it's a mystery. It's, we don't really know exactly. We can't know with our heads, anyhow. So, um, yeah. and yeah, that when thing. I when when I was growing up in in Kamloops, BC, in mid seventies, uh, sort of early to mid seventies, a little bit after your you're probably ten years older, so you mm -hmm. yeah. must be. Um, I thought of that thing there was there was some kind of feel that I could sense. And when I closed my eyes at night, when I was nine or 10, I could see flashes and colors. And if I learned that, and so we didn't have a color TV. This is about 1970, 71. The neighbors had a terrible Viking color TV, but we did not have one. So when I saw these brilliant flashes behind closed eyelids, uh, I learned to dial back my thoughts, so turn off thought altogether. Language, Wait, how old are you? How old? About are you? Nine or so. Oh, really? Yeah. So because to get to get these flashes and then the washes to turn into something, I had to like adjust my TV set down, like turn everything down, and let that picture come into focus. And I would be in landscapes and worlds, and they're brilliant, and they were just flowing. And that became my life's work, my my practice. And so then uh, when I was about 12, I felt that there was like always an intuitive guiding hand everywhere. And I did A, B comparisons. So I'd leave home. I would leave home with a baseball that I borrowed from a boy, a new boy in town. And I would leave with a particular mindset of mental, concerned, anxious to find this boy and give him his ball back so that he wouldn't think I was just some terrible kid that took his baseball and i would never find the boy it would be like this this shaky this shaky kind of thing and i felt the field shaking like with every every burst of anxiety i felt the field going and i couldn't touch it because i was anxious and i'd never find the boy and walk around for an hour and then i would go home do this reset i go Toom. and now i'm connected to the field and I put the ball in my, my pocket and the field would run me from that point on. So like strings, I'm like, oh, okay, you're going way over here. Why are we going over here? I don't know. We're going to find empty bottles and get five cents. And then we get a uh, snack bar and oh, well, that's great. And then over to the slough and then over to here. And then adventure happens here and insight there, a bird comes and lands. And then I hear the, the, a voice in the distance across the schoolyard. It's that boy waving at me and saying hey and i walk over and i bring out the ball and he has a huge grin on his face and we're we become best friends mm. so i do this and like the field rocks i'm going to go with plan b i'm going to be guided by this thing that sometimes i call it god for geeks yeah <laughs> because it's like you can ping it with an intention and say dear field we need you to be more organized to help humanity now because we've got these things called climate shocks coming and we need you to shape the probabilistic field more intensely. You, we need your attention. We need you to pay attention. And that's what I did last year. And it's led to this climate moonshots initiative. And 
all these people meeting from the U.S. military to the big finance and everything. It's like, thank you, Field, you know, being on task of organizing all this stuff. Mm. You know, in the, a great intelligence or a great choreographer or Indra's net or whatever it is, you, know, like you can ping it with as SQL queries and it responds. It takes time sometimes. You know, I, I love this thing, Bruce, of uh, it is not uh, the survival of the fittest and what it is, and boiling it down, of course, lifting and gifting. And what it totally reminds me of um, satsang, sangha, community, mm. and how in everything that we've been doing with Ram Das for all these years and the retreats all over the world and um the thing that comes out is lifting and gifting hmm. it comes out and not just from the people that are going to the jack cornfields of this world that are going there and giving their wisdom it's from the people i mean i'm recognizing this now and i i'd love this nomenclature so i'm, I'm equating it with with my own experience where people they they there's two things go on. One is a gathering of the heart, you know, one heart as people are there in a common interest. And, and the other is they each are getting a little wisdom, you know, it might be a different part of the elephant of wisdom, but they're, <laughs> they're getting something, right? And, and then they're, they're sharing that. There's so much sharing, which is gifting, right? And so uh, I think there isn't anything that, uh, that, we do these days aside from you know the wisdom part of it is important i don't want to downgrade it but i think the the heart that it starts to feel connected and wants to naturally just give that to the next person that to me is our potential salvation in many different ways so mm. i love this lifting and gifting it's a beautiful thank you appreciate that yeah. mm. <laughs> um so uh, the first thing I did when uh, Duncan mentioned uh, you to me was uh, you did a, a beautiful video. I think it was it. Oh God, um, um, science and non-duality. I mm. believe, right? Mm -hmm. And it was the origin of life and consciousness. Now you know that was probably a that was quite a long talk. I don't remember how long, but certainly well over an hour. And we can't do that, but. Um, Actually, you know what? You know what hit me more than anything when you came on stage. I don't know if you remember, but when you came on stage, you were you were very moved hmm. in the center of your being. I could tell you were uh, by just being with everybody. Yeah, and yeah. and so on. I don't know if you can just uh, contextualize a little bit uh, from from that talk because it's uh, really important and the way in which you're able to connect um, science that's revealing and, you know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Richie Davids and all these people have been working on proving out the reality, what the Tibetans have found from going inside rather than outside uh, is, is a fantastic thing. And I really feel like, you know, you're very much part of that, but maybe you can just uh, give us a roundup of the, the origin of life and consciousness. <laughs> Yeah, when I stepped out on the stage at Sand and I just felt the beautiful intent of that group and Maurizio and Zaya and all those beings that were there, you know, you had uh, the hardcore kind of reductionist people, physicists were there. There was there were beautiful teachers there. And but the main what my main heart went out to was there were you know, like six, seven hundred people, ordinary kind of people on inquiry, who said to their own souls and their own mates and their own missions, what is the connection between this incredible world of the dualistic, you know, let's turn a bolt here and then it's going to tighten the valve there so our engine runs better, which we all totally rely upon. And in fact, our bodies work that way. And what is this other world that makes life have meaning? Because you can, you can do a whole lot of bolt tightening, but it doesn't really feel feed a part of you. And here are these people on inquiry from all levels, from all ages, who were blessedly fascinated with the 
the ridge, the liminal ridge between these two worlds and willing to be soft enough to mm -hmm. take one to the next, to take the bolt tightening thing I've got to drive to sand to now I'm at sand, I'm going to open my heart and I'm going to, I'm going to be in a place of compassion because these are safe people and these are beautiful beings and I can do that mm -hmm. while I've while I've driven here through the mechanism of society, but these people are becoming flexible enough and gifted enough and uh, trustworthy, courageous enough to say, we can, we can do all of it. We can do all of it. We can have big heart. We can open to compassion. We can, we can open our boundaries to the big thing, the, the thing. <laughs> but at the same time, we can be very good at raising our children and doing all the, the right things with diet. We can do it all. We can do it all. And so I, I, I sort of saw these quester seekers out there. And, you know, I just like, wow, they're beautiful. All of them are beautiful. All of them just, oh, my God, I'm going to get two, three days now at the lunch tables. And just, I don't know, just sinking into the beauty of their inquiry, effectively. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. So uh, now give us a little roundup on the origin of life in two minutes and consciousness. <laughs> well, you know, that was an interesting one because, you know, I don't really know what consciousness is, you know, uh, in a sense. So there's several schools of thought. One says the panpsychist school of thought that consciousness is universal in the cosmos. Uh, and it's it's a compelling argument because people have these non-dual experiences. They might have a psychedelic opening. You know, when when Ram Dass experienced absolute universal love with psilocybin, you know, as as shown in Michael Pollan's film, where the man who's who has cancer, f f there's this thing that comes, and they show it in the film as geometry that's moving. There's this powerful force that is love beyond all reckoning of, of human experience that is coming and it is a power it is a power and i think we've we've experienced our own renditions of that um, so there's the monkey mind wants to explain everything so the monkey mind like well that's panpsychism because that's made out of quantum bits and it's everywhere in the universe and it's universal so we have to come up with the nuts and bolts explanation and then there's the others that say, well, no, uh, you need the organism, you know, the neuroscientists, uh, Stuart Hameroff, you know, an, an anesthesiologist who started science of consciousness. He said, I know about consciousness. I can take it away with a single shot of some substance. I can remove it within 10 seconds. <laughs> yeah. So it probably has a chemical basis. But he entertains the idea that it might be a universal in his work with Roger Penrose. But then you come up a cropper of, is this a testable hypothesis, right? <laughs> so, so it's this dance between these personality types of a, what is consciousness. Yeah. Um, I tend to be on the more reductionist side. I, I, my gearhead brain wants an explanation because I think if we can get an explanation for how the field is made, we can, we can sink, we can uh, boot the code more clearly. And that's where this PIM insight came. And all, now you might ask the question, well, something came to you and showed you that PIM cycle. It showed you the stacking. Right. You, what was that, right? What was that? Dang. Was that made out of the field? Was it the field coming alive or was it something bigger? Uh, now here's, here's a quick answer for you because this is the great mystery in a sense. So in the jungle in Peru, uh, I would uh, use the tools that I had, the, the tools of Madre Ayahuasca, where she and I had a dance for four years in many, many sessions where we, we merged as one being. And one night, she, uh, we merged together and she showed me how I was conceived and born because I was adopted back in oh. 1962. Yeah, my, my parents uh, gave me up in, for adoption at, at uh, Royal jubilee hospital in victoria i was just left like here they go here's here's another one into the ether and what madre ayahuasca now that creates a rupture and it's really deep and it's it's prenatal right 
So Madre Ayahuasca actually, she had me shape myself into the sperm, shot me through, you know, the fallopian tube or whatever it is and into the egg and I became a being. And then four months into my growth, I started feeling in the uh, belly of my mother love. I started feeling that surround, the amniotic fluid that is, and the shape and the vibration and the warmth that is the universal love of the mother. And I felt it. And I'd never felt this be- before, Rock. I'd never oh, felt this. Wow. And then suddenly there was a whispering sound. And I, I looked into the night in the jungle and there was an outline of two beings. This is all from my nine-year-old practice of shutting off conscious thinking thought so I could get these things. And it was my bio parents giving me up at four months in utero. They decided this one has to go. We're too poor. And then the love connection dropped. So it was it was present while I was barely conscious as an embryo becoming a being felt it and then it went away and then my consciousness went out after it trying to find that love again it's all it knew how to do all it knew how to do and i came out into the world as my adoptive mother said in your own world you were like a compartment you know you were in your world so then and this is maybe the answer to the question of what is the thing i'm born i now have i've read my own boot code this is how it was made This is why I realm. This is why my consciousness goes through time and space and it can seem dissociated. But it's my superpower because it started in that moment when the love dropped and I went seeking it. So I'm standing with the Madre and standing around and saying, thank you for showing me how I booted up. And and, uh, she said, you're pretty cool. (laughs) We had a good relationship. (laughs) I said, would you like to go back to where we all began? Would you like to, even you, because you're a rainforest entity, 370 million years old. My sperm that I just became, if I reverse the clock and I go backwards, I can take us to the origin. She said, cool. So we merged and shook together. And then I pulled the lever on endo tripping, I call it, where I, I can do tripping without substances. And I then make libraries of these trips called endogenous trips. And then I can run them in a magic state, you know, in a other state as a movie, but and like on an editing table. So I pulled the lever. I said, get ready. And we went back through the join points of all organisms. The big cloud of microbiota burst through the cloud over the Hadean island of, of all of evolution and spiraled into the pool the cycling hot spring pool where the first cell learned to divide Mm -hmm. and then we were in that that endo trip inside the aya trip and i it's it's, these things happen rapid fire and you have to watch your your brain temperature because you're just it's you're driving so hard Mm -hmm. so hard and suddenly there was the the download was showing me a neon uh, lit protocell that's the one and i asked the great ineffable like what do i do and it said become it become it now so i was that protocell then i went i blacked out i lost consciousness and as i was losing consciousness i asked the great ineffable like <clears throat> what's happening and he said well you asked to go to the birth point you can't be around you know you're being born you're being created you know <laughs> get a clue So uh, I blacked out, and the next moment, which could have been many moments later, uh, I was coming to consciousness as a scream, and the scream lit up the scene of this tearing apart protocell, the first cell division, the first cell mitosis was going on, very clumsy and crude, and fingers were moving, and the fingers were the first code to guide that, and yet... As, as my body became a living cell through the attempt of division, the vacuole that bought it off was dead. Hmm. There was a clue in there that allowed us to do the chemistry we're doing now. And so I was alive. I'd seen the chemistry. And as I was being tractor beamed away from that experience, because these are very peak things, you can't stay there. So you get a tug at your waistcoat. Time to go. And you're starting to, but I always like ask the ineffable, can I ask one more question? (laughs) (laughs) 
and the inevitable is pretty cranky, but I have one more question. Inter interminable questions from you, you people. And so I said, but I felt a mind. I felt intelligence behind the fingers, the piano fingers of those polymers. I felt a guiding hand at that origin point. I felt that. But there isn't supposed to be anything in the field before life. Life generates all. And it said, all right. No, I sat up waiting for the answer on my haunches and just went blank to receive. And forming in front of me was a star field. Constellations, galaxies, the whole cosmos basically came rushing toward my consciousness and smashed into it, knocked me down. <laughs> and the answer was, you know, you silly monkey for your, all your silly questions, this the cosmos, me, whatever it is, grew big enough, grew large enough to allow you to come into being. It got what God is is the totality of all of this, and the miracle of your being through all these improbable events that led to you was made possible by the sheer size and fecundity of the system that that bubbled forth to allow you to to exist. So that was the simplest answer, <laughs> most direct, parsimonious answer to the question of is, you know, is there a creator or creative force that always was? Yeah. Just thinking of my my own experience. That, well, first of all, you, we keep you keep uh, referencing your nine year old self and the ability to turn thoughts. Uh, turn the volume down basically right yeah uh, this is not that normal i mean i myself although around that same age had a an absorption e experience that was that in you know in essence that i only knew about when i ended up in india many well 12 years later or something 13 years later uh and had uh, a meditative experience through uh being high in the himalayas and and being in in the uh, a cow shed where this uh, you know someone like a babaji from, from yogananda's book had used you know as a meditation so it had a lot of efficacy to it it was like yeah it was like ayahuasca uh without ayahuasca um yeah. but but you seem to go further back uh, and, and you know you're, you've talked about at very early age these questions came to you. Um, that makes me think about what do we think about um, reincarnation and mm -hmm. karma relative to this the uh, the great ineffable. Yeah, uh, recently I've begun to work in a healing group, a sangha. Uh, called luminous awareness and mm -hmm. we're tomorrow morning at 5 a.m we're all I'm, I'm driving out to ananda village in nevada city uh, where we do our our work every three months with a group of 65 students and some of the time we do work on primary uh childhood wounds that create things like the schizoid response the hysteric um Tomorrow we're starting work on the schizoid, which is the uh, child wounds, uh, the physical injury actually. Uh, cesarean birth early on is kind of what Stan Groff talked about mm. in a lot of his work. Mm -hmm. And what happens with all of this work is if you create an open system, not a reaching in system, not reaching into the being or the client or the person you're with to probe around in their system, because that generally causes closure. That was the new age approach in a way. You just create a spacious awareness, you know, like I am loving awareness. Mm -hmm. And you just, yeah, I'm doing it now. It's like there. And then you get come very empty. And what you tend to find is the person's system, the little parts, you know, the uh, little children that little kindergarten that makes them up and that creates the personality and comes out curiously into this great space and you start getting hints you start 
your curiosity starts getting words and flows of words might come in or a feeling because they're occupying your space curiously. And then you might make a little comment or might do something energetically because they're coming for resource. They're coming for attention and resource to be seen. And sometimes great history, lineage will download. Like people, you'll see something from generations back that occurred in their lineage. And all of this is in the service of releasing those beings from having to, to guard against being rewounded. Mm. Mm. And, and so the protector, this is uh, Dick Schwartz's system, internal family systems. And so our group is a sangha using Buddhist practice around the healing uh, in this sort of exquisite, we call attunement. And it's really a compassion. It's, it's a form of compassion and a form of love to all those little parts in there that haven't been seen and they need some resources. The, the little mini-me's? The mini-me's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by becoming empty, instead of reaching out or... But, Instead of efforting and doing, this becoming, this great emptiness, this but an open-hearted awareness, they'll come out. And uh, and if if a hundred people are doing this at once, the resource, the intelligence, the field is so strong. The field becomes manifest as an intelligence that literally moves people around the room because it it knows what to do to heal this group beyond any one individual in the in the group. So it's where Dalai Lama said that the group is the guru, you know. And he so said you're, that I don't. Uh, yeah, he said the, the, gur, the next, yeah, the next guru is is a community. It's group, satsang. not not individual. That's satsang, yeah. And so, in a sense, we we recognize that uh, when when this moves into the into the room, it's like a great rock concert, you know. When it mm. when the energy just goes up and everyone is taken by it, you know. And you can feel it turning on. And now we are being carried and wafted by this thing. We do the same thing in, the, in our mm -hmm. healing arts and awakening school. Um, and uh, because in a sense, no one can awaken and if they're uh, feeling pain or if there's a part of them that's blocked uh, that, that they don't want to ever look at. They can't open to them. They can't be free. And perhaps if awakening is freedom from, if, if suffering is the cycling of those parts constantly trying to cope with that wound and the wound is never resourced it's never allowed to roll out mm. so that that's what work we do yeah so through through this and, and again going back to when you were very young have you felt over the years a, a continuity that goes beyond this lifetime in terms of everything that you are everything that you represent in your work and so on so say that again. My phone, my AI was trying to get my attention. Oh God, that AI! Can't you? These doggone AI, pesky AI. Yeah. Um, just uh, thinking about you know, since these things happen to you at very very young age, and some realizations at very young age, have you over your over the span of your life thought of the continuity beyond just this lifetime and what you came in with and the you know your whole that whole ayahuasca trip mm -hmm. around you know coming in and and then being uh, fostered and so on i mean that's an extraordinarily powerful thing but i have to think you've had some connectivity to a continuity um beyond this lifetime similar as far as i'm concerned to his holiness i mean mm -hmm. you're it's more transparent seemingly with you with these things happening at that kind of an age his holiness being a tulku, you know, and so on. And and how the Tibetans really, they, they have this shit worked out, man. I mean, yeah, they, they have this shit worked <laughs> You know, as I come to study it more, yeah, I've, for me, it, it's sort of very simple. When that moment of rupture occurred, when I was embryonic, but just waking up, and my consciousness chased the love that was disappearing, the love connection that was going, it never stopped looking. It never stopped trying to find it. Mm. And so it, it, I mean, I remember very young, like practically in the crib 
when my three-dimensional uh, processor turned on, I remember the slats, these, these shapes resolving into a crib. Hmm. And I remember cartwheeling out of the hospital up to the limb of the earth to find out where I was coming from, where this, this place, you know, very, very vivid. Mm. And so in some sense, uh, I gave my consciousness permission to travel, uh, call it the realmer. And the, it was traveling in order to take the little one that got dropped and entertain it and distract it to some degree and saying, I'll take care of you. I'm the wanderer, I'm the traveler, we'll take you on trips. And I only in the last two years found the little petal, the little most basic part of me at the very bottom, a little petal of awareness that was so protected by the traveler, it never got wounded when the love went away in utero. It it's, was preserved. It, it didn't have much. It doesn't have any cognition or any what language. It's just a petal shape. Mm. And but it was protected by the traveler. So in some sense that created a process by which uh, my consciousness smeared out across time and space. So it went back to the origins and it smeared. It's a, like a probabilistic thing, like an electron smearing through generations. Because I'll get these downloads from gen, from Rome. I'll get this. These days, I'm getting downloads from the 2060s and 2070s. S- serious downloads, like really? alternative futures, because we're doing this climate moonshots project uh, with a whole group has come together to create uh, a heartfelt but very, very pragmatic and very, very, uh, in a sense, uh, masterful way of linking parts of humanity to other parts to build infrastructure so that civilization bridges over the shocks that are coming. And I'm flying to Australia in a week uh, to do a talk in Sydney uh, called Vision Vision of Hope and Action in the Time of Climate Shock, because the whole of Australia is in shock. They're in a state of traumatic shock. The mm-hmm. festival I was going to, Rainbow Serpent, was effectively canceled because the so, wildfires went through the site. They oh. burned right through their site. Oh. Oh. And uh, so I'm going there to, uh, in a sense, bring this realmy kind of nature. So in, in terms of, of generations and reincarnation, my particular variant of it is that my consciousness is reaching and contacting beings in the future and probabilistic beings and seeing the pearls of the shape of them and uh, obstructions in 2037, which seems to be a really uh, challenging abutment that we have to get around for some reason. And then it, it goes back. And it also goes into space because for NASA, I designed spacecraft and architectures. And uh, for the last 20 years, I've come up with ways to land people on asteroids, ways to build lunar bases, ways to open the solar system by a membranous encapsulation of asteroids to create worlds. So it's my my job, it's like my profession to realm spatially and temporally. So in, in terms of reincarnation, uh, here, here's the only clue I've got. Mm. I said I said to the field about two years ago, because so many things were lining up that were so improbable, and throughout my life, I said, well, gosh darn it, how, how can this be? How can such improbable things be lined up continuously on this little slider rod that as I get there, they, they appear? And the timing is just perfect all the time. And the voice whispered to, to my befuddled head, <laughs> well, after all, it's your universe. <laughs> so it was like, uh, what does this mean? Does it? Yes, you are a center of probabilistic. You're so complex with your hundred trillion, you know, neurons and gut biome and mitochondria. You, as an organism, are so big that the number of neural pathways in your brain, if you reverse the way electrons flow, is larger than the countable, uh, countable sub- subatomic particles in the universe. Terence called the, the the most deeply ramified matter. You know, in his in his characteristic drawl but um so you're already over the threshold 
the Atman is the man, is the is what is. And so as you walk along, those tendrils of probability and, and s- s- tremendous things are just moving in and out of your system and they're crafting your reality. But so is it for everyone else. And so when we come close to another, the tendrils intersect in complex ways we can never characterize. And we're densely interconnected by you know annoying smartphones that interrupt audio <laughs> and and that's another layer another ramified layer is the smartphone which has densified everything so that more improbable things can come into being and mm. things that christians might call miracles you know or this stuff is just accelerating and accelerating and accelerating and intergenerational healing and the 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 respect for elders and where we came from especially all the way back where life came from deeply knowing that deeply caring about it and deeply caring for life's future creates this universe around a being that is just knowing it just suddenly rests in perfect knowing and perfect gratitude for what is Mm -hmm. and and then in a sense the healing for all the all generations come into this perfect gratitude that we exist at all we're so improbable in the universe we're so improbable Mm. so i don't know if that's a straight answer to your Mm. your inquiry there well you know what to me how you express uh, everything you've been expressing of course and some of the things i've watched that uh, talks that you've given and so on bruce it's just so uh, there's a a feeling of warmth spaciousness and and love in it all which is not so present in many of uh, of the uh, forums uh in which scientific theories are expressed um i just um we actually worked with uh, we did this movie with Ramdas called Becoming Nobody and uh, it's just it's still out in theaters now actually um and it is available everybody out there as a download and a dvd if you still use those kind of things um i it's just so uh, heartwarming to go back to what you said uh, earlier and and we talked about and i gave it as a an equation equation lifting and gifting and it all seems to go back to that propulsion inside somebody to do that what you're doing and but the, the way in which it's you're doing it is is not devoid of of that which is ineffable right even though you are going through the systematic scientific inquiry, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. At the same time to forget the reality of what's inside us, which I'm saying in this movie is, is obviously very relevant, especially now that Ram Dass is, is not with us to see the way in which at one point in the movie, he says, when is what you want? When is what I want enough? When is what I need enough? It's a lot more interesting hmm. when you start to think about other people, which hmm. is lifting and gifting. And this is something that it struck me when I first met him all those years ago. It brought me to India where I found the source of what he was talking about in this human being. So, wow, there is a possibility, isn't there? There really is. And to have these things come together and, and of course all the work that his holiness the dalai lama is doing to in, in just this exact same vein around you know people understanding what true compassion is mm-hmm. and the way in which we have no choice um and as i said in a note about uh, people are asking well what's going to happen now that the foundation you know ramdas isn't here well ramdas is here mm-hmm. he's here in and and it's what you said uh, mentioned what his holiness said which is us the satsang the sangha is the guru Hmm. and uh 
and I, I just love that you, you exemplify this, Bruce. So I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh-huh. And thanks for being here. And we want, you know, we've, uh, uh, we'll have to talk about this privately, but we got to get you out and, and join us at one of these retreats and, and it'll be a wonderful mix. We, uh, I don't know, have you ever done anything with Robert Thurman, by the way? I see him at Sand, but I haven't done anything with him. Oh, God, it would be so great. Okay, I'm going to make it a big thing to get to get a, to get you together with him in one of these things that we do. It'll be real fun. Thank so, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. I mean, you know, you are quite busy, and the way you travel, God bless you. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, it's it's really something. So um, everybody, we're going to have show notes, and we're going to lead you to different. Uh, t- certainly, the uh, the uh, origin of life and consciousness uh, talk from Sand from uh, Science and Non Duality that uh, that Bruce did. So uh, everything will be available there. And uh, can we talk again? I mean, you know, this. Yeah. Can we, can we talk again sometime? That's all I got to say. Absolutely. And just for the listeners, uh, we, I created something called the Levity Zone years ago. And it was actually looking into uh, the eyes of Sasha Shulgin, who was no longer had sight, but his whole being was the pure embodiment of levity. And I was so moved by Sasha at the end of, of life, of his life, that uh, the, the we're building a community here in Northern California and Boulder Creek around this old pioneer property I bought 21 years ago. And I'm building the Gandalf house on the hillside. It's a <laughs> multicolored, it has a dragon wrapped around the base and it's a beautiful, uh, it's Gandalf's house with help from what a workshop in New Zealand. It's official, officially his house. I'm, I'm Gandalf the grain <laughs> at this point. I fought many a Balrog, but, uh, of yet to fight the big one. Uh, but this this land, ancient oaks, or we call it wildflower, is going to be for Sangha. Mm-hmm. It has hosted hundreds of groups in the last 21 years, and now we're refashioning it as a community-based retreat. And you're certainly most welcome oh. to, to use the space uh, for what you're doing in the continuing work of your Sangha. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. What's it called? Uh, ancient Oaks Farm. Uh, but you can, the purpose, the you you talked about what the purpose is. I can't remember the term you used. So the the purpose is to reland and revivify what community can be. Mm-hmm. So every Wednesday we're going to be having Wild Wednesdays where anyone can drop in. Music is played because if people experience this over and over and over again, they experience the compassion and the sharing and the music. They'll get used to it. They'll come out of isolation and say. I sat, I had my body needs met because I was sitting close with a group that were playing a guitar and suddenly I felt so much better. We've lost body closeness. We've lost Mm. tribal touch. So that'll be just one thing, but other groups and works, uh, there'll be all kinds of activities Mm. here because I want to live in, you know, I want to live in that world Mm. of, of the continuous and it's good for geeks too, because we have the Digibarn Computer Museum with this, the whole history of computation, 125 uh, years of artifacts. And we have Tim Leary's library as well. Yeah. And uh, so there's the psychedelic history on the property. Mm. So it's a resource for uh, this work as, as a physical location. And mm. people are welcome to. Uh, and the, the podcast is called The Levity Zone. And it's uh, That's the it. one Levity. That, the Levity Zone. The levity zone, and because if this is a late night discussion with Terence McKenna at one point, where he was talking about AI and singularities and the eschaton, and I said, Terence, we have enough novelty. We need more levity. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, that's so great. Again, thank you very much, Bruce, Bruce Damer, everybody. And you're going to find out much more. And we're going to give you a lot of linkage on, on the show notes. So you'll go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash MindRolling. And uh, we shall see you all again next week. Mm-hmm.